morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Botti in Washington. Today is Friday, June 23rd, and here are some of the stories we're covering. ECOWAS is confident Saturday's presidential election in Sierra Leone will take place under peaceful conditions. Generally, the preparations are on course. We've met several stakeholders, and uh, it appears like uh, the country is ready to have the elections. Journalists covering Sierra Leone's election campaign say they are being harassed. Ugandan legislators criticize the slow police response to a student massacre. Liberians react to the arrest and incarceration of a former chief justice. Africa calls for an equitable global financial system to address poverty and climate change. Any plan of this nature that helps a country to transit needs to take into account the circumstances of uh, any country that is going through this type of plan. An Zambian gender activist launches a payload project for the country's university teaching hospital. The stories plus something O'Malley sports are coming up on Daybreak Africa. The U.S. Coast Guard says a missing submersible likely suffered a catastrophic implosion near the wreckage of the Titanic, killing all five people on board. Coast Guard officials said during a news conference on Thursday that they have notified the families of the crew of the Titan, which has been missing for several days. Debris found during the search for the vessel is consistent with the loss, said Real Admiral John Marger of the 1st Coast Guard District. Search and rescue officials say the crew likely died on Sunday before military planes with sonar detected banging sounds in the water, potentially an SOS. Some of them had paid $250,000 to take part in the expedition. An official of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, says the sub-regional body is confident that Saturday's presidential election in Sierra Leone will take place under peaceful conditions. Abdel Fatahou Musa is the ECOWAS Commissioner for Political Affairs and Security. He says claims and counterclaims of pre-election violence were sporadic and have no significant magnitude to disrupt the process. Musa credits the Political Parties Registration Committee for introducing what he calls a de-conflicting arrangement for parties to hold their rallies. Fatahou Musa tells me that the whole planning process reflects a consolidation of democracy not only in Sierra Leone, but for all West Africa. Generally, the preparations are on course. We've met several stakeholders, and uh, it appears like uh, yeah, the country is ready to have the elections. There are claims and counterclaims of uh, pre-election violence. Uh, have you taken note of that? We've taken note of everything. There have been a few skirmishes in uh, Bo and uh, also some of them in um, Freetown itself. Uh, but uh, today we had a meeting with the National Office of the National Security, ONS, uh, who say arrests have been made as far as Bo is concerned, and investigations are also going on. But these uh, incidents of violence are sporadic, isolated, and uh, I don't think they are of such magnitude as to disrupt elections on Saturday. We've also had some political parties, uh, you know, claiming that uh, they are going to boycott the elections, but uh, we've not heard that from the main APC, the opposition party itself, uh, nor the government party, which is the SLPP. So we just feel like these are the usual posturing before elections. The opposition also called for the resignation of the Electoral Commission a few days ago. And uh, the position of ECOWAS is that it is too late to try to call for radical changes about 72 hours before the elections. And so what we have observed is that the campaign period has been relatively peaceful. And uh, credit has to go to all the stakeholders in Sierra Leone. And uh, you can see signs of consolidation of uh, democratic culture in the country. You have just returned from uh, Guinea-Bissau where they had elections. Nigeria just had its own election. There's a referendum that took place in Mali and Liberia soon to be having
having its own election this year. What does this indicate to you about democracy now in the ECOWAS region? In fact, uh, James, you are right. Given what happened in West Africa from 2020, where we had at least three successful coup d'etat and then uh, a few unsuccessful ones, what has happened in the last year or so gives a lot of um, hope for optimism in the strength of democratic culture in the region because one characteristic of all the elections that we have observed over the last few months is their peaceful nature. It is also the relative credibility of the whole process and also the indication by observers that by and large the elections were credible, they were free, they were largely transparent and that gives hope for the future. Ambassador Musa, thank you so much again. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much, James. Abdel Fatahu Musa is the Commissioner for Political Affairs and Security of the Economic Community of West Africa. This echo us. He was speaking with me from Sierra Leone's capital, Freetown. With journalists on the election campaign harassed and security concerns blocking some female reporters from covering events in Sierra Leone, media associates call for better protections and greater support. Sinanu Toll reports for VOA News from Freetown, Sierra Leone. As a journalist, Kadia Tutoli is keenly interested in politics, but she says the risks that come with the beat keep her away. Even her managers at Advocacy Radio are reluctant to let her report on this month's elections in Sierra Leone, she says. When it comes to reporting on sensitive issues about politics, the management will be scared of sending us as women going through. Because we, we are seeing, even within political parties, they burn, they beat, they will be intimidating women. So, the Port local based journalist instead volunteers with political advocacy groups so she can safely take part in politics. Ahead of Saturday's vote, and with isolated incidents of journalists being attacked and harassed online, advocates are calling for better protection. In one incident on June 14th, supporters of a political party attacked BBC and Reuters journalist Umaru Fofona as he covered a press conference. Onlookers intervened and came to his rescue, says the Sierra Leone Association of Journalists. Sierra Leone's government says systems are in place to keep political parties accountable. And they say journalist associations and political parties work together with the national security to create a working document on covering elections. Emmanuel A. B. Toure is the acting director for government information services at the Ministry of Information. So we've had several engagements, you know, even with the, the launching of the media regulations as well as the electoral regulations, all of them were part of it. And they now know the parameters of how to protect themselves and how to work in contact with the security forces, how to cover uh, crises or how to cover the elections. But more action is needed, says Millicent Cabo, executive president of the Sierra Leone Association of Women in Journalism. The election doesn't end on voting day. So what happens after the election, the post-elections? They will still continue doing programs. They will still continue going to the political parties for interviews to do their programs. So we need the protection of women journalists and we also need them to be given the space to do their work. Media watchdog Reporters Without Borders says violence against media in Sierra Leone has decreased in recent years. But the Association of Women in Journalism says more can and should still be done. Sana Nutot for VOA News, Freetown, Sierra Leone. A cross-section of Liberians has taken aback at police findings into the murder case of a relative of Liberia's former Chief Justice. On February 22nd, former Chief Justice Gloria Mususka reported an alleged attack on her home, which led to the death of her stepdaughter, Shalo Musu. But on June 21st, the Liberian National Police said there was no intrusion at the residence. Reporter Rita Jilabwe Duo has details from Monrovia. At a special press briefing held at the Ministry of Information in Morovia, Police Deputy Inspector General for Crime Investigation, 
Kanye Prince Moba announced that, that former Chief Justice Gloria Musu's cat and three members of the home were linked to the death of Charlo Musu. Former Chief Justice Cart and the other suspects were charged with murder, criminal conspiracy, and providing false statement to law enforcement officers. We, at this point, have identified strong suspects into the murder of Charlo Musu in connection to that incident which occurred on February 22nd at the home of former Chief Justice Councillor Gloria Musu's car. Strong suspects in this case are Councillor Gloria Musu's car, Gertrude Newton, Alice C. Johnson, and Rebecca Winsner. Those are all occupants of the house during the time of the incident. Councillor Jerome Verdier is the former head of the Liberia Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Prior to police investigation, he alleged on a live radio program on social media that the attack on the home of Councillor Scott was masterminded by the city mayor of Morovia and secretary general of the ruling Congress for Democratic Change, Jefferson Koji. However, the Liberian National Police has declared Koji and others as persons of no interest because, according to Inspector Moba, Councillor Verdia provided no evidence to substantiate his allegations against the city mayor and others. The one who divulged the information to the public before the police uh, could get in touch with him is Councillor Jerome Verdia, who had repeatedly said to us he had no evidence, whether documentary or whatsoever, but he was giving us information information that we can use. And that information was not information that we can use to prosecute people who had no valid evidence. Findings from the police investigation have generated mixed reaction from the public. Joseph Stoboffi, a resident of Morovia, believes that the police report is politically motivated. He says with the speed and level of complexity at which the investigation was expedited is not likely of the Liberia National Police. Stoboffi cited cases of mysterious deaths in the country that he says the police failed to properly investigate. The three auditors are there. Oh, we saw nothing. The three missing boys are there. People die in the street every day with serial death. What happened? They just suffer that poor mob of nothing. So, oh, they're dark. They check for all kinds of Who got churches? Oh, to me, they know. To me, all of them only because she linked with the opposition. For Catherine Johnson, the quick response to the case shows an improvement in the judicial system. She says justice should be served at all times, no matter who is involved. We need justice for everyone. So if this is what happened for her case to run fast, for the funnies to come out like this, maybe that's how God wanted for her case to go, for people to know who was the doer of the acts. In response to public reaction to the situation, Liberia's information minister, Ledger Hureni, has called on citizens to refrain from making unfounded statements and allow the court to perform its duties. To all of us Liberians, remember there's an adage in law. One is assumed innocent until proven guilty. We should not try to vilify nor to impugn guilt or non-guilt until our courts are competent enough to hear this case, hear it, and pass judgment. On Thursday, former Chief Justice Gloria Musu's cart and the other three suspects were incarcerated at the Morovia Central Prison awaiting trial. For VOA Daybreak Africa, I am Rita Drabwedu in Morovia. William Bruto has called for equity in the global financial system to address poverty and climate change. Speaking in Paris, France, during the United Nations Summit for a new global financing pact, Ruto and other African leaders called for equity in the global financial architecture. Maureen Ojiambo reports. Over 300 delegates are meeting in Paris, France to lay the groundwork for a renewal financial system suited to the common challenges of the 21st century, including fighting inequalities and climate change and protecting biodiversity. Speaking on Thursday during a roundtable meeting with the French President Emmanuel Macron, International Monetary Fund Managing Director and the President of the World Bank, Kenya's President William Ruto said that Africa needs a new financial model where power is not in the hands of the few. We need a financial transaction tax at a global level where even countries like Kenya pay. We do not want anything for free. We will pay commensurate 
to our economy. And we want those resources controlled not by IMF and World Bank. We want another organization of equals. Echoing President Ruto's call for a review of the global financial system, President Macron noted that a bold and targeted approach can transform the world. President Ruto made proposals on global financial reforms to increase financial flows for development and climate action. Among the proposals were establish a new multilateral climate action financing mechanism financed from global carbon taxes on fossil fuel, among other proposals. The summit aims at developing a new global financial system so that vulnerable countries can be better equipped to combat poverty and climate change. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa says the transition must take into consideration a just transition. In our case, we've had to take into account our own experience as a nation and as a country where we are dealing with uh, challenges such as unemployment and poverty and also dealing with a history of division in our own country, of racial division and all that. So any plan uh, of this nature that helps the country to transit needs to take into account the circumstances of uh, any country that is going through this type of plan. The summit themed building a new consensus for more inclusive international financial system is working towards enhancing cooperation among the international community by uniting as many partners as possible around a common roadmap against the backdrop of the international tensions. Reporting for VOS Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Giambo in Sacramento, California. Members of parliament have blamed the army, the Uganda People's Defense Force, for their slow response to the massacre of dozens of students. They say the survivors and people in the area have been left traumatized and need psychosocial support. Reporter Mugumi Davis Rakariji has more from Kampala. At least for the three people, mainly students, were killed by the Islamic State-sponsored Allied Democratic Forces in the southwestern district of Kasese, which neighbors the Ara Congo. On Thursday, visibly shaken parliamentarians blamed the army for a sluggish response to the attack. Florence Kabugo is a woman member of parliament from the area. One student managed to escape and ran, away and ran to a police station, which is 800 meters away from the school. Reported that unidentified people have come to our school and they have started killing students. I managed to escape and I'm coming to report this. The police did not respond. The, according to the students that, who survived, they told us that the killers spent about one hour killing them. They even spent some time to monitor if they had all died and touch them. They burnt the dead bodies to ensure that they are all dead. She says survivors and witnesses of the attack also said that the rebels easily looted nearby shops and homes without any opposition. Kambale Ferigo represents Kasese municipality. One of the girls that died is a daughter to my cousin. These people cried for no help. It was terrible. It was real butchering, right, on the speaker. It took over an hour when our students are being butchered. Parliamentarian Harold Mohindo says people in the area are now living in fear and students no longer want to go back to school. People are no longer sleeping in their, in their homes. And uh, we have those that survived. They are being affected with trauma. Actually, I know the two of them who have been always on the watch because at some point, I think out of hallucinations, they keep on running away and they are left unattended too. Vincent Bomlangachi, Sempija, Uganda's Minister of Defense, says the government is doing everything possible to ensure people in the area are safe. The president has already given us orders to add the numbers and add the technologies to the border. The Ugandan parliament has ordered the minister to go to the site and report back with concrete measures to secure the area. For VOA News, I am Gume. 
Davis Rwakarindi in Kampala. Good Friday morning to you too. James will begin the sport with the CAF Under-23 Africa Cup of Nations Morocco 2023, which gets underway this weekend when hosts Morocco take on Guinea on Saturday the 24th of June. The competition will serve as a qualifier for the Summer Olympics Paris 2024. This is the second CAF Under-23 Africa Cup of Nations to be hosted by Morocco since the tournament was introduced in 2011. There are eight Participating countries in Group A, Morocco, Ghana, Congo and Guinea will slog it out, while Group B consists of Egypt, Mali, Gabon and Niger. Staying with the Africa football governing body, CAF President Patrice Mosepe has told the 5th Pro-Africa Congress in Gaborone, Botswana to work together in making Africa football amongst the best in the world. Dr. Mosepe said CAF is committed to promoting and advancing the interests and rights of African football players, clubs, national team member associations, Zona unions and all football stakeholders on the African continent. 5th Pro-African President Jeremy Injitab said the Players' Union are ready to work together with CAF while maintaining their own identities with the objectives of renewing their cooperation agreement. Away from football news now to handball. Tunisia's under-21 handball team lost to Germany 31-46 to points after the 24th edition of the IHF Men's Under-21 World Championships first round Group B Day 1 game played in Hanover. Tunisia, who had defeated Algeria 27-22 to points on Day 1, will take on Libya on Friday. The 24th Men's Junior Under-21 World Championships is being co-hosted by Germany and Greece and will last from June 20th to July the 2nd. In basketball news, a racism scandal has overshadowed the Spanish Basketball League finals between Real Madrid and Barcelona. Barca's Nigerian star James Naji was allegedly racially abused by the crowd as he got off the team bus before a game in Madrid. Barcelona, which like Madrid is affiliated to the city's football club, condemned the incident in a statement and demanded a firm and exemplary reaction from the league. The abuse can be heard on V published by Spanish media. Staying with basketball news, Algeria will host Tunisia in Algiers in an attempt to qualify for the 2023 FIBA Afrocan to be held next month in Angola. In the absence of Libya and with Morocco, who qualified automatically for the final round of the Afrocan, these FIBA Africa Zone 1 qualifiers will see Algeria take on Tunisia in a two-game series. Game 1 will be played on Friday, June 23rd, while the second one will follow on Sunday, June 25. Both games will be played in the Algerian capital. And that's it for this Friday's edition of Daybreak Africa Sports. I am Samson Omale in Abuja, Nigeria.